Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of the Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to CC with BB 2.0, Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. If you, wish, if you wish to support us here at Connecting with Coincidence, please like us and subscribe to us on Facebook, on, on YouTube, as well, and send us some of your stories on the YouTube channel. Um, and I will respond to them. I just would like getting stories out there. A few people are. So uh, our guest today might stimulate you to think about some. And please just put them in the bottom uh, underneath the, the, the interview. And I'll respond. There's a funny kind of coincidence uh, that seems to happen like every day. Uh, but you may not notice them. And there's a lot of those. But here's one in particular. Some of us like to give advice. To other people. It's kind of like a, a human thing. So when you suggest something to someone, that suggestion may also be something you're trying to tell yourself. Therapists, for example, need to pay more attention to the personal relevance of their advice to their patients. I don't think a lot of people do that, or I'm just being a therapist. Also, what you choose to study, what captures your attention in the world out there may be directly related to what you need to learn about yourself. Hmm, what a thing. Personally, I have been befuddled, flummoxed, and let's say just plain confused about human relationships. A after years of reading and writing about individual psychotherapy, I realized that I wrote about psychotherapy. I got two books on the subject <laughs> for what I could learn about uh, human relationships. You, you got to teach to learn, and that's what I've been doing. Our guest today will tell us a remarkable, amazing coincidence like this parallel between needing to know and studying something that reflected what she needed to know. Sophie Strand is a writer based in the Hudson Valley, New York, who focuses on the intersection of spirituality, storytelling, and ecology. Her first, first book of essays, The Flowering Wand, Lunar Kings, Lichenized lovers, trans species magicians, and rhizosomic harpists heal the masculine. Oh my, is forth <laughs> is forthcoming. I love just that's almost singable. Is forthcoming in, in 2022 from Inner Traditions, where my book's going to be published too. That's how we got together. Uh, mm -hmm. Her eco feminist historical fiction, Reimagining of the Gospels. The Madonna Secret will also be published by Inner Traditions. Her books of poetry include Love Song to a Blue God, Those Other Flowers to Come from Dancing Girl Press, <laughs> The Approach from The Swan. Follow her work on Facebook and Instagram uh, at Cosmogony. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you, you made up you made up that one i did <laughs> and at sophiestrand.com welcome to the show sophie well thank you for having me i'm very happy to be here well good because i'm happy that you're here uh it's it's uh inner traditions um got us together and maybe we'll see each other again after this sometimes because we're both playing in the same university field it looks like yeah, you know, book tours and publicity. I, you know, I'm sure that our paths will entangle. Well, we're, we're entangling right now. <laughs> we're, well, entangle is a good word. And um, it just how this entanglement works has something to do with, for me, uh, the synchronicity, coincidence, serendipity thing, because that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and it it's, happens in all walks of life, all parts of life which is part of the message I'm trying to get out there. So here is you, uh, a feminist author, 
who has coincidences in her life. Many, <laughs> yes. Many of them. And you don't get a chance to talk about them too much, maybe, or at least not the way we're going to. So this is an opportunity to increase other people to talk about their coincidence stories, as we will with you. So tell us, tell us the one you told me, because uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's so relevant to the rest of us. Yeah, um, and I think this is kind of, this one is about connective tissue, and it also is the connective tissue of all the other synchronicities that then fruit up throughout my whole life, which is when I was young, I grew up in the mountains and I was obsessed, spent a lot of time outside in the dirt. My parents were, you know, they're like, eat dirt. I think that'd be good for you. Um, <laughs> and I loved mushrooms and I loved all sorts of like little creepy crawlies. And especially I loved the, the white tendrils that now I know are, you know, the rootlets of the plants connecting into the mycorrhizal hyphal system of the underground fungi. Why don't you define um, mycorrhizal for us? Okay. So mushrooms are really just the reproductive flourish of a much bigger, more complicated being that lives underground and is actually mostly microscopic. They're filamentous cells called mycelium that branch out appetitively following their appetites, digesting by secreting enzymes into their environment that actually break down the food that, so then they can absorb it inside of them. And what they do is they connect plants and trees to each other so that they can receive nourishment from the trees, receive carbon and sugars, give miner minerals and nutrients in um, response. Sometimes they even support plants such as um, mycoheterotrophs like ghost pipe without receiving anything in return. So they connect the whole forest, they decompose things to make the soil, and then they have they create integrity in the soil that it, so that it can hold together even inside of climatological pressures. Um, wow. So, so the mycorrhizal uh, system is pretty much the basis. And here's the interesting thing. <laughs> um, plants didn't initially have roots. 400 million years ago, they made it out of the sea and fungi for tens of millions of years acted as surrogate root systems teaching plants how to have roots. Oh, you're, you're one of those mushroom ladies, uh, mushroom <laughs> people. Uh, yeah, I, I know one around here uh, and uh, go to those mushroom conferences. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. what, what's the guy's name that's big in mushrooms? Is mushrooms Paul Samets? Paul Samets. Yeah. Paul Samets, yeah. I, I, uh, so you know Paul? I don't know him personally, but I do know of him. I mean, yeah. I've been interested in mushrooms for a long time. Yeah. So he, um, Yeah, so you're with him on this. Mushrooms can save the world is some of his ideas about it. Well, I, I, the one thing I will say is I think mushrooms are definitely, they are a neglected mega science and they definitely underpin biodiversity and ecosystems and ecological resilience in general. But I also know that I am personally, and maybe that's where I should go into my story, personally keyed towards this being. So I may have a bias. <laughs> well, um, we, we, I have biases towards coincidence. So we, <laughs> we, we got these things. So Mm -hmm. You're a, you're a microrhizomal kind of person. So tell us more about where that yeah. led you. So I grew up being fascinated with mushrooms, loving them, um, feeling like they were definitely uh, magical beings. They didn't feel, you know, what we know now is humans share 50% of our DNA with them. We are closer to mushrooms than we are to plants genetically. Um, so they do definitely occupy this liminal space between human and plant and animal. Um, and I was obsessed with them. And then at age 16, I fell extraordinarily ill. Um, and no one, my immune system started to shut down. Um, every one of my body, bodily systems began to deteriorate in the space of about three days. And over about seven years, you know, there would be diagnoses that would come in, they would try experimental treatments, they'd fail, something else would go wrong. And they'd be like, actually, that means that this can't be what's happening. And but I ended up in college at Bard College, um, and I was really, really, you know, I thought if my body's going to break down, I'm, you know, fascinated with writing and with storytelling, and I'm going to make sure I learn as much as I can and write as much as I can in whatever time I have left. And I was, so I was fascinated with mushrooms, and then I encountered the philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari, who formulated the idea of the rhiz rhizome as a kind of philosophical companion. And as I was studying mycology, 
going out and looking at mushrooms in the woods, realizing that there was a whole mycorrhizal network that connected these forests and constituted them. Uh, that, that, that's that's I just pause for a minute on that yeah. on that one, Sophie. I mean, that's a mind blower. Uh, really, we just see these trees and they there's they look like they're standing there by themselves. They are not. No, they, those micro rhizomes are connecting them and feeding them and exchanging with them. They, they have good deals going on with each other uh, that, yeah. that there's this big flat thing, not flat, but big thing underneath the ground. And it's a metaphor for uh, consciousness. It's what we don't see. Exactly. And it's it's a little bit of like that collective consciousness, or sometimes I think of it as, you know, it, it really, it queers our idea of a self, which is when you have two beings making love or having a conversation that are constituted by mutualisms, how many beings are actually involved? <laughs> so I always like to offer that. Um, well, how do you answer that, Sophie? I know, you, and I, that's what I love. Fungi actually teach us to inhabit a more interrogative um, mode of consciousness, which is not looking for answers, actually plugging into other rootlets, saying, is this the most interesting choice? Not is this the right or the wrong choice, but is this the most interesting choice? Oh, I love that because I, I call it more fun. This is more fun to yeah. do. This. That's what I do. Interesting, fun. It's a, yeah. So is this the most fun, interesting thing to do? Okay. Yeah. And so they definitely, they love to get involved. They love to, to go into rootlets and connect beings and facilitate conversations between species, between ah. biosemiotic languages. Um, With what kind of languages? Biosemiotic languages, like pre-linguistic pre language, like chemical signaling, um, sound, vibratory messages. It's the way that trees and plants and animals um, and flowers communicate with each other. Semiotic usually means something about symbols. But yeah, so they're sending symbols to each other, biosemiotic. Bi through... bio Boy, I went to Swarthmore, I can tell. <laughs> you went to Bard, I mean, <laughs> you got even, <laughs> but the Hudson River made it even more spacey than our creek did. <laughs> wow, that's out there. Okay, biosemiotic is such a cool concept. Yeah, and I've always been interested in how to root, you know, because I've experienced such intense bodily pain and breakdown, there's always been a tension between mind and matter, between wanting to ascend into these super heady philosophies and then knowing that the really important thing is to root back in, into, into the body and into a situated ecology. And so it seemed to me in college that mycorrhizal systems were this way of bridging the gap you know, creating an actual rhizome between these heady philosophies and ecological rooted information. Sophie, um, is there is there an answer here to the mind brain <laughs> problem? <laughs> um, I don't know. It but, wasn't. Uh -huh. Yeah, that you're just talking about liminal space being bridged. And well, I'm not saying that that's an answer, but it's getting me to think about the connection between mind and brain and rhizomal uh, biosemiotics. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll just leave away for that. But that's please keep going. I'll live the question instead of answering because that's maybe the more interesting choice. But <laughs> as I was, I was pretty as I was deepening my studies into fusing. Um, I studied medieval storytelling and narrative, um, so I was fusing my ideas of of what storytelling could look like with this interest in mycorrhizal systems. And given at that point there was very little research actually easily available about mycorrhizal system. So it was really like going through pretty dry, um, scientifically um, jargonish papers <laughs> and really trying to educate myself on, on how to be able to enter these papers. Um, and at that very moment, when it seemed like, this is also a whole other little microcosm of coincidence. I, so I had a lot of anaphylactic reactions all the time, which is when, you know, what happens when you eat a peanut and you're allergic, you know, you go into cardiac arrest, your throat closes and they really couldn't figure out why I had them all the time. So well, you say that so neutrally. Wow. <laughs> Those so are I, scary I think, times. Those are scary times. I think I've had probably over 20. Um, and some of, some of which bridging that, that um, into probably an NDE, a near death experience where it took a really long time for them to get me stable. Um, but I went to, so I went to an immunologist and here is the best, most coincidental, strange aspect about it. I was sitting in the waiting room 
And I've always been told that I'm very flexible. I'm like acrobatic. I can do very weird things with my body. I make weird faces. Um, I have a lot of, I've always thought of myself as being a kind of physically comedic person. Um, and I was known, I was known in high school for being able to, you know, do the most sit-ups in a minute, doing weird physical feats. And they didn't always leave me feeling physically good, but I could accomplish them. And now I know that this is a marker of my condition, but I was sitting in her office and I was sitting in a very particular way that didn't feel weird to me, but apparently looked very weird. And the immunologist came out to, to ha ask me to come in and she said, do you always sit that way? And I said, yes. And she said, that's a very strange way to sit. She was like, I, my, my hand was bending back. My legs were wrapped. I was, I don't even know how I was doing it. And she said, I don't think you're here to see me. I think you have a connective tissue disease. We need to get you to a geneticist. So she, her, the coincidence of her walking out into the waiting room, catching me doing this very specific position, which then turned out to be totally true, which is I found out that I had a connective tissue disease and fungi are the connective tissue of the soil and of the forests. And it was this moment where I realized that my love of fungi had been almost genetically implanted in me from birth that I was always going to be keyed to connective tissue because it was something I was struggling with in my own body. Um, yeah, and, and we're here to connect people with coincidence. So try to tell us what connective tissue problems are as you relate them to the connecting of the mycelium. Yeah, so mycelium acting as connective tissue is one that they hold the soil together and they make the soil. And so the soil doesn't, it's like when, some, when a river bank erodes, it's because the soil doesn't have any integrity. The bacteria, the fungi, um, the archaea, all of the things that hold it together have died off. And fungi are really, really key in breaking down dead matter, turning it into rich, dark, nutritious soil, and then holding the soil together. They also act as connective tissue as they mycorrhizally connect different um, ecological niches. And what I realized, so my issue is I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and it means that collagen, which is the, um, the vehicle of connection inside all of your bo bodily systems, it functions in your eyes, your skin, your veins, your vascular network, your heart, um, doesn't work correctly. You're, oh, you're too flexible. They think Houdini, Houdini had it, ah. actually. Ah. And you're, you're too flexible, your veins are too lazy, you know, you're prone to organ ruptures, to hemorrhaging, to bleeding, and dislocations of joints. So I pretty much, I dislocate a joint every day. Um, <laughs> and I, but, but this had been happening for so long without a diagnosis that I'd gotten really good at just popping them back in. Um, and no one had ever said to me, like, this is very weird. <laughs> but for me, it, it seemed to be, and this is kind of the thing that I try and offer to people is the issue in me opened me up to an ecological issue. So it didn't, it didn't have a solipsistic effect. It wasn't that I got involved in my own suffering and pain when I understood I had connective tissue. It said, this is a way of you understanding the greater ecosystem you're a part of. Which you had already been building on anyway uh, yeah. by looking at the micro rhizomes. The, the, the coincidence part of this, of the timing of the immunologist coming out and seeing you sitting there, um, that kind of um, timing uh, characterizes a lot of coincidences. And yeah. I, I tend to call it human GPS, being in the right place at the right time without knowing how you got there. Yeah. And there it is, it happens. And it's a form of understanding connection. There's, there's something going on between you and the immunologist that uh, you both don't know, but she wants to help and you need the help and something is right for you to get there. So when I talk about coincidences, I'm talking about coincidences as marking the connective tissue of relationships of human beings to each other and to the planet and other living beings. I love that. Yes. Perfectly said. It also really, for me, it, it seems to encapsulate the erotic nature of matter, 
which is that we are drawn to each other, that yeast cells that are kept in a dish and put under ecological strain form multicellular bundles, that we are, we are drawn to get involved. And so it's also, it's that, that erotic pulse that we wanna be intimate. We wanna touch someone else's life. We want to help them. The erotic impulse, boy, I'm behind that one. Uh, Cause it's gotta be more general than what we usually mean by erotic. Yeah. It's, uh, it's that drive to connect, to be part of something else. Yeah. And this is where I get in a bit of uh, concern with spiritual development because people are focusing so much on themselves and not about their relations to others. And my message in the coincidence project is continuing to get articulated like yesterday, uh, firmer, more firmly, um, that I'm here to, to develop a cartography of the psychosphere which will, will show us how interconnected we are so that we can become more compassionate with each other. And better than that, to have more fun with each other is a basic idea. I love that cartography of the psychosphere. I mean, that is a gem of a phrase. Um, as oh, and, a and, yeah. yeah, and you're one who could recognize such things. So thank you very much. I love that. But yeah, I actually just wrote a piece that was talking about how fungi really help us trouble this idea of individuation as being the only thing we should strive for. Um, yeah, and you know, the mushroom that fruits up looks like an individual, but really it's just a, a tiny little reproductive fruit of a much bigger being below ground. And I think that we can use that to complicate our idea of what individuation is. Um, Go ahead, please complicate. Yeah, so I, I think, Sometimes I think that deep time has seasons that are longer than human lifetimes. And there may have been whole civilizations that lived under the zodiac of a certain kind of ascension meditation. And perhaps that was necessary. There's no way of knowing. I do believe that the world as a, as a biological entity doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> but I also think that we are in the season right now of descent. And the descent is, is moving from that rugged individual, that object of capitalism, where you have to make it on your own. You don't wanna connect with other people because you don't wanna feel like you're dependent on anyone. And we need to sink back into our bodies and into the soil and realize that we are constituted interstitially our nuclei flow into the mycorrhizal systems. Our nourishment comes from our intimate involvement with our ecosystem. Constituted, what did you say? Constituted inter uh, something or other? Inter interstitially, that our intelligence doesn't exist in a brain or in a self. It exists between people and between beings and between, great, it, 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 between gradients of ideas. Um, that's you're articulating better than I am what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, I feel the same way. So that's what I mean. All, the best thinking happens between two people talking. Truly, truly, yeah. This, this, this is uh, this, this is like I, I want to get I want to get this out there, but it's got to be <laughs> said in a way and diagram in a way it's there's there's pictures here that are necessary so yeah. i i have a parenthetical but i don't think it is parenthetical question for you being yeah. as being as you love nature and i told you i like trees and i get along yeah. with trees but that's not about the trees you we've been talking indirectly about them i'm talking about another branch of uh i don't know phylogeny that doesn't get much attention the mushrooms don't i mean that they've been and you're trying to bring some attention to their beingness as yeah. is paul samus and others but what about <clears throat> my friend the slime mold well slime mold is actually a type of fungi they um, other and, people think they're not well yeah and here's the that's the great thing which is it's like lichen <laughs> too which is that there are all sorts of beings that are holobionts which you know as we are composed of more bacterial cells than we are human cells we are also ecosystems more than we are individuals and so i think slime molds and lichen kind of are more symbio symbiotic um queerings of our idea of what a species is 
Um, I do love slime molds because they can make decisions. They can navigate through mazes that they seem to have a innate ability to solve problems. Well, they also have, at least some of them do, and this is what I got, or I'm not clear about, have this interesting idea of being individuals mm -hmm. and kind of like being individuals maybe to, to make babies by themselves. And then when the times are right, I think it's when things are, when they're getting out, running out of food, sometimes anyway, they all come together. And then mm -hmm. as a group, they move. It's like yeast too, which yeast are single cells. But when they are, there have been a couple of experiments that have been published actually in the past year that have shown that when you put, you know, when you starve yeast, when you put them under ecological pressure, they form multicellular organisms that then when they reproduce, don't reproduce unicellular organisms, they reproduce multicellular organisms. So it's this oscillation between having to navigate the world as an individual and then knowing then also flowing back into that deeper understanding that you are part of something that is constituted by relationships and i think sophie we are right there right now yeah we got and you kind of saying it but the slime mold analogy is a simple way of diagramming it and actually yeah. kind of showing it uh that that you can, the, sim, the, the individual becomes part of a whole where everybody decides to join each other. And so I suggest that uh, us individuals recognize, at least for some of us, that we are part of what I call the collective human organism. And this collective human organism is kind of what, like where the individuals of the slime mold are getting together, get together. I'm suggesting that the us individual cells not only do it with each other, but in groups, but as part of this collective human organism, and then do something to stop messing up with our planet and beating up on each other. And the other ways of saying this, but get, make things better as a, as a cohesive group. Yeah. And, you know, I love to think of that idea of morphic resonance and that if more people think this way more often, it will become more easy to think, <laughs> um, more easy to, to speak in this way that is generously encompasses the fact that we aren't rugged individuals. Um, generally, that encompass that we are not resident individuals. Yeah. That's, 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 well, we share... Uh, this passion of individual to, to group. Um, but I, I, let's st step back and have you describe yeah. slime molds a little bit more. So, because uh, I've, I've read about them and studied them a bit and we've jumped ahead for what they can do, that they can do intellectual things. Uh, they, they can oh. figure out, they can figure out stuff. They can learn. Yeah. I mean, I will say that slime molds are not my like complete area of interest that I don't think I could like, I could speak on them for 10 minutes. How about um, two? How about two minutes? Yeah, or how about a minute? You know, when I do know, I, this was included in Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, which is a great book about fungi. He talks about how slime molds, when you make a map of like a Tokyo, um, of Tokyo, they can, they can recreate the same um, roots as the subway system. That, they, that they're intelligent in a way that, you know, we have to really plan and they seem to just do it innately, um, which I think is interesting. And they also complicate our ideas of what, what is cognition? Is cognition a, a, the ability to have, to create art and to participate in culture, or is it the ability to make choices and solve problems? Yeah. And, and so I, I think slime will fit into an interesting conversation about what it means to have a mind. Yeah. Well, we'll leave that. We'll leave that alone. But I, I, there's more to be learned from all of these other creatures about who we are and how we function, because they they are out there in part as mirrors of ourselves, uh, in part because they are part of ourselves and we are part of them, but they are separate and reflective. And just the way I started off saying, and what you had to learn is that what you study was a reflection of what you needed to know about yourself. But that's yeah. that's the same idea that we're that we're playing with today and let's play with another set of ideas here because i think it's fun uh to talk words with you 
uh, the, your name is Sophie Strand. Mm -hmm. And um, you were studying connections, uh, connective tissue, uh, both underground and uh, in your body. And the strand is a, a name for uh, some of the parts that can, a name for some of the parts that connect with each other. Yeah. So there was strand and there was your name, Sophie, which is Greek for knowing and knowledge. So knowing strands was your name. So it was already embedded in a third way in your name, what you needed to learn. There's also more co coincidence baked in there than even I have shared with you, which is that my main area of interest finally developed into, I wrote a project that you mentioned earlier about um, Rabbi Yeshua, who is probably the version, you know, the earlier version of what becomes the Christ Jesus. Um, the kind of shamanic, oral storytelling, um, wandering magician. And I became fascinated with Gnosticism before knowing that Sophia is pretty much the main character of Gnosticism. So that was also an interesting circuitous moment where I, I felt like I came right back to myself, right back to the origin where I was like, Sophie, Sophia, wisdom, oh. Um, but yeah, I do, I feel like I had my interests baked into me from birth with my name, with my connective tissue disease, um, yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, strand comes from the German for sure which is how it actually flows back into my heritage, which is it came through Ellis Island um, with my ancestors. And the shore is that liminal realm between water and land. It's the place where intraactivity happens, where the water is working on the sand, the sand is working on the water, things are flowing both ways. And so I like to think of strand as also being a symbol of that intraactivity. So at Ellis Island, they got their name Strand? Yeah. I think it was something else crazy, but also German before that. <laughs> yeah. And Rabbi Yoshua before yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar with the uh, Kabbalistic thinking starting in about the second century when it was supposed to have started, but you're talking about something before Jesus. Mm, I'm talking about Gnosticism as you know, Gnosticism is an ecology of practices. And I think that there's been a modern simplification of what Gnosticism is, when the truth is that it was many different types of spirituality um, that all got homogenized when they were um, demonized by the original Orthodox church. So Gnosticism relates to many different competing practices, but I got interested in Gnosticism as it relates to early Christian um, communities. Uh -huh. and through the Nagamati text. And when I'm talking about Rabbi Yeshua, I'm talking about Jesus, but Jesus as he would have been a Galilean Jew. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah you, yes. Okay. Um, you have a lot of coincidences in your life. Uh, and there are some, time, some periods of time when they seem to be increased. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And one of the one of the big questions we're having these days in the coincidence study business is what are the variables that increase um, coincidence frequency? So could you tell us about what your experience of that is? I have a feeling for me, coincidence is a sign that I'm on the right track. And when coincidences begin to escalate, um, I, I know that I'm moving, even if things feel incredibly murky, I'm moving in the right direction. And I think I actually the past two years have been an increasingly vertiginous experience of having so many synchronicities in my life. It almost felt like, oh, this could be mental illness. This is very intense. <laughs> um, but I do think for me, when things begin to become synchronous, I know that I'm in alignment. I'm not in control, I'm in alignment. Um, and I think for me, the closer I've moved to the things I love, the more I've gotten in touch with what I really care about, not what other people are telling me to care about, the more coincidences have flowed and fruited up in my life. Uh, fruited uh, reminds me of uh, mushrooms. That's all that I, I use that word a lot. I mean, actually, here's a great, here's a really good um, 
anecdote that explains that, which is when I graduated college, I wrote, I had written a short book about myth and rhizome and, and mycorrhizal systems. And I tried to get it published and everyone was like, this is too obscure. No one likes mushrooms. No one's like, likes fungi. No one wants this. And I put it away. I was like, you know, people don't like mushrooms. It's just going to be my hobby. Who cares? No one wants to publish it. Put it away. I wrote a big novel about um, Rabbi Yeshua and Mary Magdalene. And that seemed much, I was very, I was devoted to it, but it, it, it seemed much more culturally um, popular. And then at the very start of quarantine, I'd finished my novel. I'd gotten an agent immediately. I was going off to sell it and it didn't sell. It just didn't sell. And I thought, and I got 20 rejections. And I thought, you know, sometimes you have to put things down. You know, I thought this, everyone told me this was going to be big had lots of readers. It's not happening. So I put it down and I was in such an intense place. And I've been increasingly, I've been returning to my love of fungi again, because it was, I was spending all this time alone, all this time outside. I, I continued to be a mycophile, but I hadn't been writing about it in years. And I returned to the fungi and to writing about them obsessively. I had no plans for a book. And I started posting all of my myth and mycelium stuff online. And all of a sudden within, within four weeks, I'd written a whole book and had a book deal. And it was the book that it was pretty much a more mature, more fermented version of the book I'd tried to sell earlier. <laughs> and then only after that, did I sell the Madonna secret to the people who had bought my mushroom book. So it was this kind of entangled looping where the, as I followed the mushrooms and as I got back to them, the synchronicities and coincidences in my life began to amplify. How do you explain that? How do I explain it? Here's something. I don't, I don't like to provide general unifying theories. I'm not a scientist and I'm also because I've lived in a body that has known such incredibly intense breakdown. I know that you have to be prepared to, to realize that you're wrong every day and to reassess and to be adaptable and to be agile, mythologically, spiritually, physically. What do I think these coincidences mean? I think they mean that I am in courtship with the world. And that the world is dancing with me. And I think that when you're not approaching your, when I say world, I mean ecosystem. I mean, all of those beings that are, live within 20 miles of me, um, that inhabit my world, um, that my mycorrhizal system flows into and out of. Um, I think that I am benefiting them if I am, in, if I am experiencing synchronicities. I think it's a way of finding your ecological niche, that there's some way it could be evolutionary, an adaption in an evolutionary context that takes us into our ecological niche. I like to dance. Yeah. And you described dancing with uh, your ecology. Yeah. Um, in order to dance, usually you have to decide to dance. And it really helps to have some music, although it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have other people around, although that's not necessary either. Yeah. But there's still this kind of entrance into the dance. So when I talk about explanations, I'm talking about situations that increase the probability of coincidences. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it's when... When I have an idea, I usually follow it. I'm like, I'm going to follow this for a week. And if, if, I, if putting myself inside that relationship, I think you enter into the dance by opening the door and seeing if something flows through. And if something flows through, you have to let it in. And the co you, have to, you have to invite in the coincidence to your life, I think. Um, and af after and you invite it in by believing in it. It really helps to believe they happen. It certainly does. That just yeah. that they're there. They're there all the time. I mean, I think the thing is that they're there all the time. People are, you know, I think it, it's Alistair Crowley said, you know, in terms of prob probability, you know, the chance of you 
rolling like a six and a two is just as improbable as you rolling a six and a six, you know, that we think of, we think that probably like extraordinary circumstances look extraordinary, but everything that happens to you is incredibly improbable. Everything that happens to you is synchronous in a certain way. It's how we define it. Um, yeah. And it's, it's the, this every, it's all coincidences can be said something true or all serendipities. And in fact, we live our lives by serendipities, which are a little different where we get, and we need a little information and it comes to us and it's just a small thing, but it just happens to be there partly because we're looking for it, partly because we need it. So part of what you are doing, and I think we have to do is to, to move. You have yeah. to open the door what you said that it's there may be all around but there are good ones and not such good ones there are better ones and big ones and we pay attention first to the wow look at that man that's really something but once you had enough of them you begin to say oh well okay so i i love this song uh, by magdalena bay um that uh, kind of a new uh, kind of a new group and i just heard them and i want to play it at our dance place maybe sometimes uh, called secret you're a fire and i said wow i played this and i started looking all around and there and then in new yorker is an article about magdalena bay um it just uh, that's that stuff is fun or i think of i'm thinking something over here like harry potter my grandson mentions harry potter i read about harry potter in a book about physics and stuff it's like uh, those coincidences happen a lot and they're kind of like fun but then there are the bigger ones like the immunologist walking out and seeing you or Deepak Chopra happened to come out of the men's room when the meditation guru comes by and then they start connecting with each other. These are like life changing ones. So there's, there's strata of meaningfulness, meaning how much does it impact your life? And I, I'm kind of more interested in those, although the other ones are kind of clues. So the, the, when you were needing to get a book out, and you couldn't get it out so you just had to give up but your need was there yeah and need is a big driver of motion so i i'm writing a book now that i hope to get published called that tentatively called the dog that trots about finds a bone i love that well that's what i'm trying to do in in general <laughs> is i i i love that because i think that your desire is the the magnet that draws in that critical moment that anadiodromia, I think it's called in Greek drama, the turn of events, the eucatastrophe. Um, but you, you, do, you do have to need it. Yeah, I think eucatastrophe, do you know about eucatastrophe? No. Eucatastrophe is this concept that Tolkien developed in relationship to fairy tales, which is, it's that moment when all hope is lost, when the, the complete miracle happens when the eagles swoop down and save Frodo and Sam from Mount Doom, you know, when Aslan arrives in Narnia. But the truth is that the Yucata it's, it, it's the good catastrophe, but it can only ha it can't happen in a banal moment. It has to happen in the critical moment of need. So the need is, is the, the void space that calls in the coincidence. Good. It calls in the eucatastrophe. Good. Well, I, I came to that through Deus ex machina. Ex machina. Yeah, yeah. But this is a little bit more flourished. This one, the way you describe it, has more dynamism to it. Well, you catastrophe, the big formulation for, for Tolkien is that the difference between Deus ex machina, machina? The, 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 uh, the, the god from the machine. The god from the machine, yeah. And that used to be in plays, so other people know about this, the used to be in plays where there's something bad about to happen and a god descends into the play, right, into the play itself and saves the day. That's the deus yeah. ex machina. Tolkien's big difference is that it's a fairy tale logic rather than a mythic logic in that the, sa the, the savior comes from within the logic of the fairy tale. It doesn't actually explode the logic. The God kind of ruptures the whole order of reality when, when the God arrives. And the eucatastrophe are the eagles that do live in the ecosystem of Lord of the Rings, of Middle Earth. So the interesting thing for me about the eucatastrophe in relationship to coincidence is it says coincidence is ecological. It is adaptive. It is natural. It is the most natural thing. That's great. 
that one I, that one almost puts together almost everything we're talking about today it's like and the coincidence is there uh, but you've got to create that vacuum yeah that need uh, for it to happen and then i go to uh playing with the word nowhere uh and, and putting a line between the w and the h and getting now here huh. open nowhere is now here <laughs> I love that because I also feel like that kind of describes where I am right now. How does um, it do that? How does it do that? I've, I've lived in the same place for two years. I've been in this very intense solitary experience that I didn't choose. I didn't order off the menu. Um, <laughs> and this kind of um, uh, unconsensual asceticism that has been um, necessitated by my health issues and also by... Uh, relationship breaking down before all of this and I, I think of myself sometimes as being in this place that has no it's an, a, an ecstatic presentism that's almost agonizing it's like there's no the past is kind of melted the future is incredibly gray but I am now here <laughs> wow and which ends up feeling like you're nowhere yeah I mean it goes it goes between Sometimes it feels like everything is so vibrant and, and beautiful that you have to write something, which is how my writing has been born. And sometimes it does. It does feel like nowhere. It feels like a void. Um, well, that gets to another one of my favorite little things there. I like to know what reality is. I've been that's that's what this coincidence thing is like, <laughs> yeah. is what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen. They're not telling me something. I, yeah. I went to some of America's finest schools and they still didn't tell me what they told me is go figure it out yourself is what happened. Mm -hmm. So but I want. OK, so that's what I've been doing. So what what is it? what what is it that's going on here what are we trying to do i forgot what i was going to say now i got so excited about talking about that where was i going with that uh let's we're see we're talking about now here the nature of reality oh yes thank you the nature of reality well how could i forget? that little thing yeah <laughs> that little thing so that little thing i like sine waves i like spirals so what you just described with the ecstasy and the agony, mm -hmm. name of a book about Freud, uh, agony and ecstasy is a sine wave of going yeah. up and then down. And that's the way energy moves. Let's, light waves and sound waves are all like sine waves. And so many other things, it's a expansion, rarefaction, the sine waves. If you turn, if you, if you take a, a helix, like the double helix for uh, DNA, and you you cut it down the middle so it's two dimensional, you end up getting a sine wave. So the the relationship between the sine wave and the spiral is right there. So these are two fundamental aspects of how reality moves. And what you're doing is experiencing the essence emotionally of how reality moves. Do you want to get and you want to get thank out you. of it, it thank sounds, you for <laughs> thank you go ahead please no i don't i don't want to get out of it but i want to keep moving um and i think yeah you have to keep you have to keep moving um keep going through those experiences and perhaps you know sometimes i think about certain trauma modalities and the window of tolerance and yeah. it really only becomes intolerable when you're going outside that when the sine wave is going outside the window of tolerance when you're going into overactivation or paralysis. Um, and so I do think that there, there's a certain kind of aspect of my life that it's been necessarily extreme. Yeah. And it has acted on me so that I can create a lot of work very quickly. And I think it's not that I don't want to stop cycling. It's that I'd like to come back into a window of tolerance. Yeah. And, and that, that gets to what I'd like to see happening is that the sine wave has an ascension to it. Yeah. So that so that the bottoms aren't so bad and the tops are even better. Yeah, yeah. And that's the spiral part of it. It keeps going up rather than just yeah. sideways. Yeah, I love spirals. I oftentimes think of spirals as as the best metaphor for my life, which is that you return to the same lesson, but at a different altitude, <laughs> or at a, at a different um, location, but it's the same spot. So you're learning the same thing in a very different way. Um, 
Agreed. I've just noticed that today. I, I, I'm, I'm involved with a, a relationship now that looks very much like one that caused me a lot of trouble before. <laughs> yeah. but, but this one's better because yeah. I'm, I'm more cognizant of it. And I've learned stuff from the one before to be able to like know what to avoid and what to expect and what to appreciate about this one. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing if you notice it. And it's the same with the coincidences. you got to notice it. And you got to believe that you it's there to be noticed. Yeah, because literally, and I think you know this very well, believing is seeing rather than seeing is believing. It is. Yeah, the belief sphere. I mean, gosh, we, we get out so much sensory stimuli on a daily basis. We gate out miracles all the time to homogenize our culturally agreed upon reality. So we just have to open up that sensory gating. Where's that song? We homogenize reality to what would you say? That, that's a song, Sophie. <laughs> I don't know. That's a song. Well, you okay, gotta I'll see. keep that in mind. That's a good that's that's poetry, right? That we homogenize reality to be able to survive. But you said it better uh, than that, that than I have. So we're coming, we're coming to the end of our, our discussion here, Sophie. Um, we have a little bit of time uh, to talk about, well, what else do you want to tell us, Sophie? do I want to tell you yeah um I don't well I'll tell you the one thing that I tell everybody which is that I do think that I'm very interested in the fact that we are relationally constituted and that we are more nested matryoshka dolls of being than we are discrete individuals but I do want to honor the differences and the patchy heterogeneity of life and that it's those differences that involve curiosity and that involve that um, invite transformation. So I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a person who writes about ecology and environmentalism, but I don't ever want to advocate for a kind of blanket environmentalism. So I think the one thing I would add is the most profound coincidences will lead you into your ecological niche. You know, just as the bee goes to the flower guided by appetite, it incidentally pollinates other flowers that if you follow your very specific ecological desires, the things that you want to smell, the people you really want to spend time with, you will incidentally pollinate something. And in so doing, create coincidences. Yeah. Just read a little something about being brave and oh. acting bravely, also creating coincidences. How do you think that works? I love that. I always say that happiness is an act of bravery. The happiness is, is a moment when you take a chance. So I love that. Well, that, that allows us to, to end with uh, some word play. Um, uh -huh. Let's play with some words, which I want to, I want to see where you go with it and then we'll stop. Okay. Uh, the, uh, coincidences are often described as chance events. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, there's also this idea of taking a chance. Uh-huh. So they fit together somehow. Uh, taking a chance and chance events uh, are describing the same thing where coincidences can happen. I love that because taking a chance and chance coincidences, it, it, it oscillates, it sine waves between active and passive, between receiver and giver. And that coincidence is this interactive event where the coincidence is acting on you, but you also have to move towards it and act on it. That there's this, this mutual exchange. You, you are benefiting. It's like that doctor that came out. There was something about my involvement in that that benefited her in a way that I couldn't even see. It's so important to notice what you just said is that coincidences are often bipersonal. And we tend to say, oh, it happened to me. It's so amazing. I woke up me. I know but it also impacted her somehow yeah. in a way that you'll not know, but sometimes you can ask the other person. And that's really fun to say, wow, I never thought that that affected you that way. So yeah. it becomes this interpersonal thing. So we are emphasizing the place of the person in the ecology, but it's still a person in an ecology. It's yeah. still a person there somewhere, but it, it's much more diffuse then we like to think of ourselves with our skull and stuff as the big boundary. Yeah. Sophie, a delight. Totally. Thank you so much. This has been lots of, lots of fun. Well, you know, that's the idea.
<laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the most interesting choice. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere, like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.